remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And since the last time we spoke, since the last time we did one of these shows, the Michael Brown uh, decision in the grand jury case has come down out in Ferguson, Missouri. And the results of it were not pretty, uh, at least locally, in terms of us having a lot of rioting and looting and buildings being burned. And we've had all kinds of marches and movements where people are going into stores and trying to shut them down on Black Friday. And all kinds of protests are going on. And we're told by a lot of different people that all of this protesting, all of this kerfuffle that have happened since the Michael Brown verdict, or not verdict, but decision, that all of that is simply the next chapter in the civil rights movement in America in 2014. That this is the next logical step for the civil rights movement in America to progress to. That that's where it's going. The next big civil rights fight. Well, when I hear that, I think a little bit, and, and, and I don't think that makes sense. I, I don't think there's an equivalency there. When I think back to the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and granted, it's easy, to, it's easy to oversimplify it. I don't mean to do that here, but in a very general sense, when I think back to the civil rights movement of the 1960s and what people like Martin Luther King Jr. stood for, I think of things like wanting blacks to be able to go to the same schools as everybody else and, and, and to not be denied access to uh, certain colleges or to be able to open businesses and own homes and, and vote and, and do the basic things that are a requirement for just living a normal life. Things that blacks had been denied, uh, at least to a certain degree, prior to the 1960s. And while it is certainly debatable whether or not the federal government in the 1960s overset their bounds on certain occasions when implementing all of these things, the bottom line is that we can all say today in 2014 that we no longer live in a world where any of those things happen. Where we no longer live in a world where someone can be denied, uh, de denied access to, a, to an elementary school or a college because of their race. We no longer live in a world where you can't buy homes in certain areas, or where you can't open businesses, or where you have to drink out of a certain water fountain, or where you can't vote. None of those things happen today. We're better off for it. And in that respect, the goals of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, at least in a general sense, were noble, worthwhile, even perhaps necessary to a certain degree. In that sense, you have to take your hat off to the civil rights movement of that era for bringing about that change. That change was necessary to a certain degree. And the fact they fought for those things was laudable to a certain degree. Now I know we're, we're doing a, a great overview of this right now. There were certain things about the civil rights movement that were problematic, but in a general sense, their work was noble. We're all better off for it. Their work was so successful that as we sit here in 2014, if you are a person, black, white, whatever, who is 50 years of age or younger, then you have never lived in a time, you have no memory, no conscious memory of a time where Jim Crow existed. You have never lived in a time where a black could not go to the same school as a white, or couldn't purchase a home, or couldn't vote, or any number of other things. All of that is in our distant past. If you're a white man who's my age or younger, then you've been around blacks the whole time you were educated, all the schools you went to, you've worked alongside blacks in all your jobs, you've lived alongside blacks in all your neighborhoods, you've seen them excel, you've seen them do everything you can do. All of those civil rights issues in the 1960s are gone. They're, they're done and dusted, as the British would say. We're all better off for it. So I have a hard time seeing the civil rights movement of that era being compared to what we're seeing today. There was a change at some point. I suppose you could say that in the late 60s, into the 70s, certainly into the 80s, what passes for the civil rights movement in America kind of turned a corner. And instead of talking about, hey, let's, let's get a situation where African Americans can have 
the same basic rights that everybody else has. Well, once they got those basic rights, certain members of the civil rights community, in order to maintain their position of, I don't want to call it authority, but maintain their position of influence, then decided, okay, now we have to demand a little bit more. The 70s and 80s, then all of a sudden they wanted, they wanted to have a civil rights movement that leaned towards making excuses for individual failure. Lean towards radically changing American society. It was no longer about we want blacks to be able to participate in American society. It then started to take the tone of we need to change American society. There's something problematic about American society and American history, and it must be changed. That was the first red flag. And you move forward to today, and you hear those who would claim to be civil rights leaders today or, or those who would aspire to those positions today talking about all of the issues and the problems that the black community faces in 2014. But the dirty little secret, that's not really a secret, it's as obvious as the nose on your face. The dirty little fact is this, unlike the 1960s, in 2014, all of the problems facing the black community are really self-inflicted wounds. When we talk about the, the problems in black America today, what are we talking about? We're talking about the broken homes. We're talking about the, the fatherless families. Okay, those are things that people are doing to themselves. Those are choices they are making. We talk about the incarceration rate. We talk about the crime. But there again, issues that individual people bring upon themselves. Nobody's doing that to the blacks. Certain people in that community, a certain small group in that community, are doing it to themselves. We talk about the poverty. Again, you go back to the individual decision making. So it's far, far different now. And yet we're told in the civil rights movement of 2014 that people that are running around Ferguson and St. Louis County and now many other places in America shutting down freeways, shutting down malls, trying to shut down stores, rioting and looting and doing all the rest, we're told by those people that there are still issues in black America that are somebody else's fault. Well, if that's the case, I'd like to know what they are. We're constantly told of institutional racism, and yet any of us can look around and see members of every ethnicity doing exactly the same things we're doing. Working hard, making money, putting together a life for themselves and their families. And so we sit here in 2014 with a shell, I guess, of a civil rights movement that is now advocating a thief, that is now advocating someone who attacked a police officer. They're advocating lawlessness. And I guess that's all that's left for them now. In this version of the civil rights movement that exists today, I guess all that's left for them is to stand on the side of a criminal who tried to kill a police officer and to complain that blacks are not allowed to get away with committing crimes. I think that's what Martin Luther King Jr. said about a man should be judged on the content of his character and not the color of his skin. It strikes me in 2014 we're actually doing that as a nation? That the justice system actually did that in the Mike Brown case? And now what passes for a civil rights movement is upset about it. Seriously. At this point, I think seeing what's going on today, people advocating for attacking police, people advocating for theft, advocating for those who would break the law. And if that's what today's civil rights movement stands for, then I think we must ostracize it as a society. It has served its purpose. It's passed its sell-by date. Civil rights movement of yesteryear served its purpose, largely honorably, and really it has outlived that purpose. And to say that is not an insult. To say that is to have some degree of admiration for what they were able to accomplish. To have some degree of admiration for the last 50 years of the world in which we have lived. That's no small feat. That's no small accomplishment. But today, in 2014, what passes for the civil rights movement is advocating far more harm than good. 
Now, as I said, none of this is meant to minimize the accomplishments of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. There are many positive contributions. But an intelligent person can recognize and give credit to the positive things of the past while also understanding that it was just that. It was the past. And there are no, in this case, there are no connections to the world we live in today. The civil rights movement has served its purpose and served it well to a certain degree, much the way that buggy whips served their purpose in the 1800s, much the way that eight-track players served their purpose in the 1970s. But much like the buggy whip of the eight-track player, the civil rights movement no longer serves a noble purpose today, no, no longer serves a necessary purpose today. We all live in the same America now. We all live in the same world in which we all can apply for the same jobs. We all can live in the same places. We all have all the rights that everybody else does. And isn't it glorious that we do? So the job has been done. Hats off to you for it. And so now in America, maybe instead of focusing on what makes everybody different, which frankly isn't much, maybe we should start focusing on what makes us all the same. And as such, it's time for the civil rights movement as it stands today to step aside and gracefully bow out of the American picture. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius, Travis Cook. We will see you next time.